I'm delighted uh, today to present former President of the European Parliament, uh, Pat Cox, with the Gold Medal for her outstanding contribution to discourse. Um, the Society awards the Gold Medal to those who particularly excel in promoting discourse and intellectualism. Uh, in 1780, Wolf Tones and Passion Pleas for Irish Freedom earned him the Gold Medal for Oratory, and later Bram Stoker went on to win the Gold Medal for Composition. In recent years, we have awarded this medal to Anson Suki, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Mary Robinson, Jeffrey Sachs, Judith Butler, and Angus Deaton, to name but a few. Pat Cox, uh, here beside me today, served as President of the European Parliament from January 2002 until July 2004. During his presidency, he campaigned ceaselessly throughout Europe to promote the enlargement of the EU, including vigorous campaigning in the Irish referendum on the Nice Treaty and the subsequent accession referenda throughout Central and Eastern Europe. I'm delighted today to present him with the Society's Gold Medal for outstanding contribution to this course. So, Mr. Auditor, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a really, really great uh, pleasure and honour for me to, to be here with you today uh, and to be the recipient of uh, this uh, distinguished uh, recognition by the College Historical Society. Um, I don't know that I'm fit to qualify with the long list of uh, dignitaries that you've described. But as a graduate of this college, as someone who spent my final year living in the GMB, uh, where we are now meeting, uh, it really is a very, very special uh, moment for me personally, and uh, I, do, I do thank you for it. I studied here in the early 1970s, and I've been thinking a bit about what it is I ought to say here uh, today, and actually found myself rehearsing different things I might focus on. But if I go back to that time, something that I would observe is how the circumstances around us create for us life opportunities, threats, and that many of these wider forces are things well beyond our individual control, but we become the beneficiary or otherwise of their outcomes. It's not unusual for people of my own vintage to have been among the first in their own extended families to have the benefit of a university education. And there's an increasing propensity by a lot of people of my age and just a little bit older to, in a way, clap themselves on their own back for this great and prodigious breakthrough that happened. And indeed, it was a social breakthrough when it did happen. But of course, it was the gift of a policy process that opened up access to education in a way that had been excluded. In Ireland, when I was in primary school, you still had to pay to go to secondary school. And that very fact alone caused some families never to have people to go to a secondary school. And the universities, for many people, were places apart. They were elite in the sense of small numbers and the level of access was much lower. And we happily went through a transformative period in Ireland in the mid-1960s, which created for a whole generation a set of positive opportunities. When I was leaving university, Ireland at that time, along with the United Kingdom and Denmark, had joined the European Economic Community. Now, I got married in the year that I left uh, college. And anachronistic as it would seem to virtually everyone in this audience, my wife, who worked in the public sector in Ireland, was obliged to resign from her position because the Irish law at that time did not recognize the right of a married woman to work in the public service. Viewed today, you might ask, how could that be? But that's how it was between conservatism and inertia, that that had survived beyond itself. <coughs> Happily, one of the early elements of impact of Europe and Ireland 
was a whole raft of new equality legislation. And happily, not long after we got married, my wife was offered her job back again because EU law had been transposed into Irish law and again it changed uh, opportunities for a whole generation of uh, Irish women. I mentioned those things when we could talk about the introduction of the consciousness and environmental standards, uh, the equality laws, the fact that we as a small state, and we remain of course a small state and in geographical terms peripheral, the fact that we as a small state found what I would call an equality of status in our membership of the EU. Not an equality of size, but an equality of status. And if you want a short and elegant summary of the fruits of that equality of status, you will find it nicely summarised in a recently reported valedictory dispatch written by a former UK ambassador to Ireland, uh, Ivor Roberts, who talked about the effects of this engagement, two nations at the same table with such constancy, as being one of the key bridges that built the self-confidence and mutual trust, that built the capacity to build the peace process in Northern Ireland. So in ways direct and indirect, these things have counted. I thought I might mention it to you, because of course the same hypothesis holds for you, that circumstances that you don't control, but that do define the age that you will graduate in, can start to influence the shape of your life. I would like to add, if I could, before I come to that, one set of things that really don't come up when, when we discuss the the engagement of this uh, small state in the, in the wider world. Whenever, for example, we joined the EC, we had a, a referendum in 1972, which overwhelmingly uh, got a positive uh, vote. And there were very big and clear economic interests in voting yes. And sometimes you have to wonder in a little bit of a way, we're so pragmatic in Ireland, whether in uh, that period, we married for the love of the bride or the love of her dower. Uh, and maybe if the idea was there, it was a bit of each. But when I got to the European Parliament, I was elected in uh, 1989. I had the privilege to serve in a period where an older generation of Europeans who had known and survived the dreadful alternative of the Second World War, implicitly personified all the good reasons why being together for them made sense. The first president of a directly elected European Parliament in 1979 was Madame Simone Veil from France. Simone Veil was one of two survivors of her family, all of the rest of whom perished in Auschwitz. And to this day, she carries on her left arm her tattooed number as, uh, as one of the uh, survivors of uh, that uh, dreadful uh, Holocaust. She worked in my group side by side with German colleagues. I remember one of them, Martin Hulsfuss, now deceased. Martin, after the war, went on to be a, a general in the Bundeswehr and an active uh, uh, constituent part, as Germany was, of, of uh, NATO. But I got to know him well enough to talk about his experience as a young man. And he had been sent to the Eastern Front uh, when he had uh, finished a fairly cursory military training after being conscripted. And his commanding officer told him he would be dead or seriously injured on the law of averages within two weeks. And he hoped that he would survive. And indeed, he was seriously injured and did survive. But what I found extraordinary is these two people whose younger life experience could have sowed in their own spirits, in their human spirit, the seed of division and discontent 
actually worked together day by day in a very ordinary workaday sense as fellow parliamentarians. And I took from the very ordinariness of what they did something powerful and extraordinary about the institutions that had been built that could accommodate and develop that sense of common interest. I found that story in your remark, Mr. Auditor, about the work I'd done on enlargement. That brief took me to Central Eastern Europe a lot, including to the Baltic States. And in one of those I met a man who at the time was an MP and the chairman of the European Affairs Committee of the Parliament in Lithuania. In 2003, I found myself with the privilege in Athens of speaking on behalf of the European Parliament as its president at a ceremony where the treaties of accession were signed by the 10 states that joined the EU in 2004. And of course, one of those states was Lithuania. And one of the guests who sat in the audience in uh, Athens that day was a man called Vitanis Andrukaitis. He today is the European Commissioner for Health. I saw him and I saw that he was quite upset and inquired what was wrong. And he said to me, there was nothing wrong, but he'd just been speaking on the telephone, on his mobile, to his 95-year-old mother, living in Kaunas in Lithuania, which is in the middle of the country, a bit like Athlone or Port Leash in Ireland in geographic terms. And she was recalling with him, and he was overcome by the emotion of it, how his father, who was a, an engineer and a part-time municipal councillor, was rounded up by the Soviets when they annexed the Baltic states in 1940 under a dirty deal between von Ribbentrop and Molotov. And he was deemed, by virtue of being elected, to be potentially counter-revolutionary. And he and his young wife were taken to a gulag on an island in the Arctic. And my friend, Vitanis Andrukaitis, was born on the gulag. And when Khrushchev <coughs> took over in 56, those people from the Baltic states were allowed to go home. And the tear in his eye was the recollection of a thought shared between the mother and the son of how proud the deceased father would be that the son had made the journey and completed the family's journey from the gulag to a new sense of freedom and engagement that was freely chosen. And these things have marked my European experience and have allowed me to see in it things that are deeper than and coexist with all of those other policy domains which rightly are part of our attention. I could tell you other stories, but I know I have a time limit today and I want to return to, to, to the wider theme. I've touched on these things because I really do think that they matter. The spirit that people bring, the values that they have, the vision that they're prepared to share really do count for something. And I would say that the only certainty I have as I compare what's ahead of you with all those decades ago, what was ahead of me to do with context, my only certainty today is uncertainty. If I look at the European Union, it carries deep scars from the financial crisis. Some of them are healing very slowly, but they have left a political divide between the North and the South. They've left a socio-economic divide, uh, particularly to do with so many people, and especially so many people of your generation in Southern Europe, especially uh, without uh, any job or any immediate prospect of one. The immigration crisis, which has failed to find a common European response in terms of solidarity and ended up instead finding an uncommon response in the form of states at least temporarily and still for the moment closing their borders one against another in a Europe that had moved beyond that some time ago. 
We have the fears right across Central and Eastern Europe, especially, of Russian revanchism, of Crimea, of what happens in Donbass, and anxieties about what might happen in the future. We have, of course, Brexit. We may come back to that or not, comments or questions. And then we have the arrival of a new administration in the United States, where it seems that the politics of rupture may be part of the package deal, at least for the immediate period ahead. It's hard to know with precision, because everybody's in a, a wait and see and settling in period. And it's hard to know with precision, because we have to see what will be the effect of the usual American constitutional checks and balances. And we already see through the courts some of those. But the rhetoric in the new administration about NATO, about Europe, and about trade is largely consistent with the inaugural address, one of quite an aggressive nationalism, and therefore with spillovers that one can look to. On the European continent itself, we have a year of, I think, defining elections. We have elections in March in the Netherlands, in April and May, and later in the summer for the Assemblée Nationale, elections in France, we have elections in September for the Bundestag in Germany, and most likely to do with its constitutional settlement, Italy will probably have an earlier election and probably sometime this year. I don't want to get into the detail of all of those, but I would say of all of those elections, the one that carries the most uncertainties, depending on the outcome, is the French election. As the opinion polls currently stand, with all the health warnings we should have about opinion polls getting <laughs> dropped, and that opinion can change. As they currently stand, neither of the established parties of the Fifth Republic, the Socialists or the centre-right, now the Républicains, neither of those looks like they will get to the second round. And so it will be something new and different if the current polls are to be believed. And if it is Mrs. Le Pen, you can expect, uh, to use the phrase again, a degree of aggressive nationalism uh, to impose itself. And that would have very, very serious spillover implications in the Union, deeper than the already significant implications of the imminent departure of the United Kingdom. To try to close out my remarks and then take this conversation where you wish to bring it. Uh, so that's for you and questions and comments. The one thing I would like to underline in a university, in a seat of learning, in a place where you have the privilege for some years to take time out, that you're not at home in school with all of the limits that go uh, on that, and you're not out yet working in whatever environment uh, that your life brings you to. One thing you need to bring from here is the respect for the learning, which is your current metier, the thing that you are now doing. A respect for facts, and to privilege verifiable fact over falsehood. It seems to me curious that I, when I was thinking about this over the weekend, do I want to get into this or not, why would one even need to have a conversation about respecting facts? Well, you know the answer. Unhappily, there is a, a rich field of alternative <coughs> facts being spewed out more and more. For example, it's not to get lost in a, in a whole load of statistics. If we look at manufacturing in the United States between 1950 and 2016, the percentage of the total employment taken up by manufacturing has collapsed from 30% to 8%. But the numbers working in manufacturing actually only went down by 7% 
for 133 million new jobs and created in other sectors. It's not that manufacturing didn't grow, it's that the jobs grew somewhere else. In fact, in terms of output over the same period, output in the United States manufacturing sector grew by 640%. And the explanation is primarily, not exclusively, but primarily a rise in productivity and an intensification in the level of capital investment. And that will continue, no matter who's president, with the fourth industrial revolution, the internet of things, and the deepening of the effect of robotics. And that structural phenomenon is there for a long time. And if anything, it's likely to accelerate. So it is simply a misunderstanding of some underlying features to blame the collapse, as it is argued politically, of manufacturing in the United States in terms of shared employment, as all belonging to trade in China, even if some of it is, but its proportionate share would be small in the scheme of things compared to what I've described. Or the other kinds of facts that show up, I would invite you to read uh, opinion polls done by the, uh, by the uh, Pew uh, Institute and also to look at the Cato Institute in the United States to do with two other things, immigrants in one part and immigrants and terrorism in the USA in the other part. It's extraordinary when you look at the uh, data from these polls, how people misperceive for example, the number of Muslims in their own society. And therefore, whatever sense of otherness or threat that they feel, how it becomes exaggerated, and how the exaggerated sense of threat becomes weaponized in political rhetoric. In the United States, asked to estimate what was the size of the, uh, of the uh, Muslim population, the respondents got the data wrong by a factor of about 10 to 1. In the United Kingdom, they got it wrong by, I, I don't have the number in front of me, but you know, five or six times to 1. In France, they got it wrong. So a very interesting thing, this truthiness that has come into things, something being true because that's what we feel it is, versus the fact is a real thing. And I really would appeal to you, it's really important for your generation's future, you personally, and that wider connection that you have with the generation. Please don't abandon the appeal to facts as a foundation for developing rational responses to real challenges that shouldn't be ignored. The second thing is to respect science. I am profoundly shocked at the scientific illiteracy and obviously <coughs> of people who refuse to accept the climate change challenge. If you look at the work of the UNFCC, if you look at the multiple COPs, of which now there have been 22, uh, the, the Conference of Parties, if you look at the generally shared understanding that had emerged in the United Nations, without precedent that so many states signed an international agreement, and without precedent that between Paris in December of last year and Marrakesh in November of this year, that so many states have ratified what they signed that it was already fully ratified and up and running. That doesn't happen with so many UN procedures at all, and certainly not in recent times on that scale. Again, I would just say we need to listen to, understand, and respect science. And the last point, if we're going to respect our fundamental freedoms and democracy, that we have to respect a free media and a free judiciary. The separation of powers is a fundamental part of the logical construct of liberal democracy. Indeed, it traces itself back to the early years of this society and the period of the Enlightenment and all that flowed from that. When you choose to attack the fourth estate, the free media, and seek to undermine its credibility, 
And when you choose to attack judges who simply do what their job is, to seek to interpret the law, you undermine something of profound value. And all my remarks on that are not limited only to what's happened recently in the United States with so-called judges being remarked upon. You had the most extraordinary and vicious attacks in the United Kingdom some months ago when the High Court found that uh, Parliament should have a vote on the uh, Brexit Article 50 process. That, of course, then went to the Supreme Court. But the three judges of the High Court were eviscerated in parts of the British media. And this was a media, that part of the media in particular, one of whose main arguments was that we have to get out of the EU to get the European courts off our back so we can become more British. And the first response was to undermine the very institutions in Britain that were part of existing Britishness and future Britishness. <coughs> because in the end of the day, <coughs> having had the privilege of spending time in an institution like this, the great thing you can bring in terms of deliberation is the force of reason. And if you add the force of reason to the force of law, mostly you can avoid the chaos that follows from the force of arms. And that is what has happened in Europe's slow learner process after two devastating wars in the 20th century. And as we stand in this new age of uncertainty, it would be a great pity not to remember the lessons of our history, lest your generation here or in other parts of the world and in other parts of Europe, by not learning it, should risk to repeat it. Thank you for your attention. It's a good question. My, my first answer is I hope so. But your question is more precise as to what I think of, not that I hope it. I think what's really important, particularly in the two elections coming in France and Germany, is who emerges at the other end as leader. Because the Franco-German process has been at the heart of what had motivated the European process for so long. And if those two parts travel separate pathways, I think the negative spillover effects could be very substantial. But I think the other part in this is that in the mood that is there today, there is a question, who among those seeking leadership in their national elections is prepared to speak also for the European perspective. Because if those who believe in something become cowed by the spillover fears of being drawn into the debate on someone else's terms, they actually concede a lot. Because instead of arguing for something in which they perceive a value, they stand back from it and therefore concede a space. So I think the biggest impact of the Marine Le Pen's, of the Gert Wilders, uh, and others of uh, that sort, even when they're not in power, is the extent to which other actors in politics self-censor from entering some areas in order not to expose a flag. A classic example of this was Mr. Cameron's response to the threat of UKIP for the last British general election. And his response, in my view, was political and tactical and not strategic in terms of national interest. He figured 
the short termism of promising a referendum covered that plank, and then he figured he would sell it. And in the end, the first victim of that fall was David Cameron himself. And so there is in it a lesson, whether it's Mrs. Merkel, whether it's Monsieur Macron, whether it's Monsieur Fillon, whether it's Martin Schulz, people in these uh, different places and in different parties, if they're not prepared as part of their own public manifesto to speak up for some idea of Europe as part of their idea of themselves, then Europe risks to be diminished. And can that battle be won, you know, some way by the European Commission or by the European Parliament? My answer to that is no, not because they lack conviction, but these battles are being fought town by town, province by province, country by country. They're not battles of the centre, they're battles on the ground. And you can only win hearts and minds on the ground. So I think the answer to your question is, watch this space over the coming months. And what do these key persons offering their leadership in their own states offer by way of perspective on Europe? I would be optimistic about Germany irrespective of how the balance of communities <coughs> works, centre-left or centre-right, that a leader will be there who will be committed to going the course. And I would be hopeful of France, because in the past, French centrists, left or right, have rallied to a call for the republic in the second round of presidential elections. But this time it could be different. Brexit is there. Trump is there, and there is a different feeling abroad, and who knows? So I think a lot will be told in May in the second round of the French election, and I think that will give the first significant answer to your question. Any other questions? Please. I'll take a few. Yeah, I'll start here and then work down. Yeah. Um, so you've been really involved in like European politics, obviously, for like really long time, but ha what's your views on like the kind of politics that are going on right now in Ireland, so say like the repeal the AIDS campaign um, that everyone's trying to fight for, what are your views on that? Okay. Who else? Yeah, please. Um, just uh, take the top. Um, in your talk, uh, I agree with your uh, sentiment in the right of the far right, the euro, so it cannot be denied that the European Union mentioned Keir Clinton and Marine Le Pen in France and the Netherlands, and I think there are two countries that voted against the European Constitution, mm. but the European Union ignored those democratic votes and went ahead and still implemented the Lisbon Treaty through the back door. So really it's no wonder that people might be turning towards more extreme politics, more nationalism, if they feel that their national sovereignty and democracy is being stripped of them from the European Um, to do with domestic uh, politics here, my, my short answer the Eighth Amendment is the sooner it's put to a referendum, the better. I mean, a lot of things are hedging between now and then. We have the this, uh, uh, civil uh, society exercise that's happening. Here, the results will go back to some of the committee and whatever. It strikes me a bit of a process of kicking a can down the road. And uh, we've been pretty good at kicking cans down the road. But when the people have been asked to make choices and things, we've been pretty good to make a choice. So we might disagree with each other and have quite divisive debates. But in the end, we can call judgments. And in the end, we have to call a judgment because it will require a referendum to make any change, however modest or however radical. Um, so my own tendency would be to say just bring it on. But I think the process is designed to push it back. Um, the rise of the far right and the point to make about the European Constitution. I would say by way of a kind of a burden of explanation, you would overburden the, the, 
going to. I mean, it's probably in there somewhere. But I've been following uh, closely the, uh, the, the French uh, system for, for quite a long while. I go to France quite a bit for work and other reasons. And following the French media closely, what's happening. And in fact, the point you're making doesn't come up much in the rhetoric of Mrs. Le Pen. The numero uno for Mrs. Le Pen, if there is a European line, would be borrowed from her father about Eurasia, which is a Europe overrun not by arms but by Muslims, and the Eurasia would be part of, of that idea. And as I said, when you look at the numbers, if you go to that human search and so on, there's a lot of people in France who feel the otherness of Muslims is an issue, so that's already a space in politics. And then who perceive the number of Muslims to be much larger than it actually is. And that's a question of fact. But facts clearly are struggling today to find expression against alternative realities. And in that context, an aggressive sense of nationalism and a strong sense of, so America first is one place, France first would be the other, French first uh, would be part of it. They're much bigger drivers. I think what has contributed a good bit to a gear shift that has made far-right populism larger has been the undeniable consequences of the financial and economic crisis. And I think it's been a much bigger driver of voter change than the real, I don't contest what you say, but the more abstract thing of a referendum held 10 years ago, burning, you know, as kind of the torch that they're carrying for freedom and so on. It is, but I actually don't think it's the driver. And so I'm not dismissing what you're saying, it's there, you can tick the box. But I think when you would look at the different boxes, it would be a smaller box and down the list, and not a thing that's really, uh, not really driving the debate. I think the injury list from the financial crisis and the more aggressive nationalism that's part of today's political zeitgeist and the anti-Muslim sentiment in general, which in France has been, of course, uh, not only observed, but deftly exploited by Mrs. Le Pen with regard to Charlie Hebdo in Nice, uh, the Bacchanal and all the other extraordinary and dreadful things that have happened in France in the past uh, 18 months uh, or two, two years. The question of European identity, um, I think This issue of identity politics, I think a big bit of the Brexit vote was a kind of an identity politics thing, who are we? I think a big bit of this French debate is identity politics. Somewhere in Mr. Trump's space, some of that is in there as well. And I think the identity politics part uh, is something that for myself, I think that's the, the one space where I feel on safe ground, I've never seen my Irish identity as being diminished by a European engagement. I saw an Irish capacity to act <coughs> as being more effective by having the European engagement. But I never saw it as a binary choice. You know, either I'm Irish or I'm European. No, I'm Irish, I'm proud to be Irish. I've only ever lived in Ireland. I've raised my family in Ireland. And this is where I am, who I am, what I am. And it doesn't get in the way of adding another layer to that onion of identity. But identity is also partly about not just self and, and feeling, but self and space. Umberto Eco, the, the, the great Italian novelist, summed it up neatly when he was asked the question, who was he? He told, quando sono a Roma, sono milanese, so he's from Milan when he's in Rome. Quando sono a Parigi, sono italiano. And quando sono a New York, 
sono europeo. And so it captures in a way that we have multiple layers of identity and partly who we are is a bit where we are. But there's another sense, it's that looser sense, but culture connects us in those ways. European culture is instinctively different to American culture. And we have a leg in each camp, of course, to do with history, language, culture, and reference. But there is a distinct difference. Even when we go to the United States, there are some cities we see as, quote, more European. And these are things to do with architecture, or cultural life, or cultural diversity. And they all touch on that question. But my bottom line, is we do not need to be less of who we are also to be effective in the European context. And I don't see Europe as taking from. I think we can add some value to our separate identities, but I don't think it needs to take from that. And that certainly has been my leitmotiv for my years of engagement. Yes, please. Um, Well, Europe is hugely facilitated access to each other, and that has been at least at a purely broader <coughs> sense temporarily ruptured by the immigration crisis. But if you have an Irish qualification, <coughs> by virtue of EU law, you will get mutual recognition of its quality in another EU state. If you have an Irish driver's license, you can drive anywhere in EU continental Europe and that license is a valid document. If you have an Irish passport, you're entitled to be treated as an EU citizen and therefore with an equality to do with access to services and so on uh, as another citizen uh, would, would uh, have. And I think, I think these have been powerful additionalities that we've had without obliging, as I said, any one of us to be less than what we are. I mean, I, it's with deep regret that I observe the, the breakdown of Schengen. We believe and hope that if we work on this and work on some of the spillover consequences of the extraordinary migration of the, the past uh, two years, that that system can be reconstructed. Because it has been one of the fantastically giving qualities of common European engagement. But I would find it really disappointing if we end up in a Europe where capital can move freely, but people can't. That was completely against my, the values I had. I don't mind that we're open for capital to move. I don't mind that we're open for goods to move. I don't mind that we're open for services to be able to move. But why should we allow all that stuff to happen? And then as human beings who created the system, exclude ourselves from accessing that kind of freedom. But language would be a huge barrier as well as just other aspects of culture. I don't see national identity being fully described. No, no, but you were asking me about the you were asking about the four freedoms. I'm defending the fourth freedom, which is the freedom of movement of individuals. Yeah, but I But, but that's then not to confuse two different things. The right to be able to move is not an obligation or pledge you. It's not a requirement. So I mean, the issue of the rights is a separate thing from the exercise of the rights. For me, the fact of the right is worth arguing for and preserving. The practice of the right is your call. If you don't want to cross the street, stay where you are. If you want to travel unceasingly, do it. You're, of course you're correct when it comes to bringing back the question of free movement and identity. 
Of course you're correct if you want to go and work somewhere else. You will oblige yourself if you want to make the most of your possibility to learn the language of the whole state if you're going to be a citizen living in that place, working there, paying taxes there, uh, and getting on with your life. But, I mean, we have one big advantage uh, as uh, Anglophone, is we are spoiled. That the Anglophone capacity uh, of most European states is extraordinarily high. So we kind of get to cheat the language barrier in a way that most other cultures don't. Not because English is the most spoken language as a mother tongue, it is the most spoken language of choice as the second language, and that causes it to be the lingua franca. It's not always perfect English. A lot of its practitioners call it globish, not English, but it does work to communicate, and it works extremely well. And that's a, a spillover gift we have from the Anglophone world. But on the issue of these freedoms, I think it's really important that if we see the worth of the freedom that allows our economy to develop through capital flows and so on, we must also argue for the rights of individual citizens. Whether we choose to exercise the right, that's our call. But the right to be able to do it was a great gift. I, I don't know how we're doing on time. I think we might actually need it then. Well, let, let me close then, and I will leave it there, with, with a very brief story of a, a man who was a very good friend in the latter years of his life, and it goes back to really some of those things that have kind of connected me to, to those kinds of questions. This man's name is Branislav Gedeman. He was a great scholar. He's written fantastic books on the history of medieval Europe. He was, through the Polish communist period, allowed out of uh, Poland on a passport to teach in La Sorbonne in Paris. And then his passport would have to be confiscated when he got home until he was allowed out again for the subsequent academic year. This man was born a Jew, and he was sent to the ghetto in Warsaw. And himself and his mother were smuggled out in a cart by a Christian who then married his mother, who was widowed, um, under a pile of dead bodies that he was being paid to remove from the ghetto. And Gary Mick went on, not just to be a great scholar, but offered his intellectual capacity to the Solidarność movement in the shipyards, when you had good people there who were committed to taking on the system, but they didn't have the savoir faire to go about some of that in terms of dealing with media, dealing with policy and so on. Geromek was in and out of prison three times. Now think of it, the guy who's a celebrated historian, a wonderful linguist, a man who was a national treasure, who goes in and out of prison. Each time he goes back to the shipyard, he's back in prison again, because he believed in that. I spoke to Geromek on the day after Poland had joined the Schengen area, and a Pole could drive across the border into Germany. And Geromek would be, at that stage, probably in his mid-70s, if I'm picking an age from him. And he told me how he sat into his car, and he drove across the border and kept driving for a good bit, had his lunch, and then drove back, and told me how he felt free as a bird. And interestingly, although a 75 or 6 year old man was speaking to me, inside was the teenager who wasn't allowed out, who was really speaking to me. And that to me was a real sense of freedom, and long may it live.